Well, good evening. I got to tell you, this brings back a lot of memories uh, going back 11 months to when this was unfortunately a regular way of life for Brother Zach and I, uh, pre-recording services. I am thankful that we have the ability to do this. Um, as we're recording this, the snow is still falling here at the church and uh, keeping everything covered. We came up uh, this morning to hopefully clear the parking lot off and try to prepare for service tonight, uh, but uh, it's not allowing us to do that, and so we're just going to go ahead and pre-record um, a service. I'm going to probably uh, stay behind the uh, pulpit as much as I can, but in the event that I uh, forget and walk out, I, I am going to show you I'm, I am wearing blue jeans here. Um, my wife was not going to let me ruin a suit walking up here uh, to church. And so um, anyway, it, just a different kind of service, but I'm, I'm glad we can at least have some format where we can hear God's word. And we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 1 again tonight. Hebrews chapter 1, we're going to look over into verse number 2 and then even get into chapter 3 a little bit and look at some verses tonight. Um, and we're still kind of uh, setting the stage a little bit for just getting into the book of Hebrews. Uh, we've done quite a bit of background. We've uh, preached about angels a little bit, and there's some more preaching that's going to be coming up about angels. Um, but uh, tonight we're going to look at a few verses here in Hebrews chapter 1. The Bible says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by an inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Then he says in verse 5, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. In verse number 7, he tells us, And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Then he says in verse number 13, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Chapter 2, verse number 1 Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard them. And then I want to look down in uh, verse number, um, look with me in verse number uh, 16. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest, in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them uh, that are tempted. Now look with me in verse number, uh, chapter 3 in verse number 2. Right, let's read verse number 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Verse number uh, 5, And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant 
for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Um, we're going to pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our time in the Word tonight. And I've titled uh, the name of tonight's message, and I believe you'll eventually see where we're going here. The, the title that I've given to the message is, Don't Throw the Angels Out with the Bathwater. And uh, what we're going to be looking at tonight is uh, a, a very specific approach by the Holy Spirit of God that the writer of Hebrews took to communicate with these Hebrew people. And I believe God's going to teach us some things about our own life from his approach here in the scripture. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless your word tonight and I pray that you'd help us, God. Thank you for biblical truth. Thank you for uh, your son, Jesus, who is the greatest. Lord, I pray that your uh, blessing would be upon this time in the word. I pray that you'd bless each one uh, in their homes tonight or wherever they might be to, to uh, tune in. Uh, to the service online tonight. I pray that you'd help the weather to clear. And uh, Lord, keep weather away, more inclement weather away, that we might be able to meet together on Sunday and have true fellowship together and uh, be back in your word again as we're back in your house. I pray that you would help those that are sick and afflicted in our church, some recovering from surgery, some in the hospital. Uh, Lord, some that are grieving and hurting Lord, we just pray that your hand be upon them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we know that the author of Hebrews, by the inspiration of God, is setting up in the book of Hebrews a comparison in which in everything being compared, Jesus is always superior. Jesus is always greater. In one of the first messages in this series in the book of Hebrews, we looked at Hebrews chapter 12 where he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And that's certainly what I believe is the theme of the entire uh, book of Hebrews, whereas he's going to point their attention and remind them of things that they, they learned and things that they had heard. Uh, he's then going to draw their attention to the Savior, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and help them to see that Jesus is superior to all things. Now I want you to uh, do something with me here tonight. If, if you have an imagination and you're willing to use it, I'm going to ask you to, to employ it right now. But imagine that you're a Jewish person during the first century, and you've grown up in a Jewish household, and uh, you've been part of a good Jewish family. Now, if you grew up as a Jew in the first century in a Jewish household, there's some things that you've been taught from the time that you were born. There's been things that your mom and dad have told you. There's been things that you've learned from the rabbi when you went to synagogue every Sabbath day. There's things that you've learned from the Torah. There's things that you've learned from the Talmud. There's things that you've learned from the Kabbalah. There's things that you've learned all along the way about your Jewish heritage, about your, your Jewish beliefs. There's things that have been assigned very specific importance in your life. Uh, there's been feast days where you've observed the Passover feast and you've observed Feast of Tabernacles. You've participated in Pentecost. And there's just all kinds of things that have, that have taken place in your Jewish home as you've been growing up and, and you've learned all of these things and the importance of these things. Now, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but I just want to remind you, if, if this is you, and in your imagination, I'm asking you to use your imagination, right? If in your imagination this is you and you're one of these uh, uh, Jewish kids growing up in a Jewish family, then you've been taught the importance of angels. You've been taught that angels are servants of God that bring important messages and that whatever message they deliver, uh, it is a true message. It is a, it is a real message. And that, that the messages that come from angels are superior to anything else. Yes, the prophets had their messages but when something is delivered by angels, that's just superior. As a matter of fact, they believe that in, in many of the cases, the messages that the prophets gave had come to the prophet from God, delivered by angels. And we know in the Old Testament uh, 
Certainly there are some instances where that is the case. And so here we have that in the writing that the author of Hebrews is writing here to Jewish people, that he's communicating to them that Jesus is better than the angels. But I want you to keep in mind here that nothing in the text, nothing in the writing of the author here ever negates that what they learned as a Jewish person growing up in a Jewish household was incorrect. The author does not come in and say that, look, you've been taught wrongly about angels. He never says angels don't exist. He, he never says, look, your, your, your uh, associations with angels are incorrect. He never says angels are absolutely insignificant. Actually, quite to the other extreme, he validates a lot of the teaching that had been done in Jewish homes about angels. He, he acknowledges, listen, they are ministers of God. He has made his angels spirits and his ministers a, a flame of fire. So he confirms in, in brief statements, he confirms that these are beings, they, they really do exist, that they really do have power. They're, they're not just... Uh, uh, they're not just uh, existent, but they have, they have power. They are powerful beings. When he says um, in verse number 7, And of the angels he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits, what he's saying there is he's likening them to the wind, whereas you can't always see them. You, you can uh, sometimes uh, see ways that they interact with us, but you can't always see angels. They're, they're like the spirits, they're like the wind, but they're also a flame of fire, and this gives credit to their power and their, their ability that God has, has created them with and given them to carry out uh, his, his uh, missions that he sends them on and things like that. So he doesn't say, no, listen, uh, we just need to get rid of everything that you've been taught about angels. As a matter of fact, he takes a lot of time to validate what they've been taught about angels. You see, a lot of times where people grow up in a Christian home, they... they start uh, later in life, they start looking into things and they start studying things. You know, it's not terribly uncommon that you could find something that you were taught or a conclusion that you came to growing up even in a Christian home. Not, I'm not talking about using our imagination growing up in a Jewish home, but growing up in a Christian home, you can find things that are ideas that you came to, maybe because you were taught them, maybe because you misunderstood something that was taught at church, uh, maybe because somebody just didn't have something in the right perspective when they passed information on along to you. And you know what, what happens is, this is just human nature. Human nature is that we do not like change. As human beings, we don't like change. We don't like to change our mind about things. Uh, we don't like to change our perspective on things. We don't like to change our routines. We do not like change. We, we as human beings, we like to settle in and we like to, to uh, be where we're going to be and we don't want to be challenged. We don't want to be moved. Uh, we don't want to change and so we don't like change. However, some things come along and they stir us up and they challenge us and it might be become a realization at some point that we need to change our perspective about something in our life, the way we view something or, or the, way, the way we have an idea about something. And here's where human nature comes in again. Even though we're, human nature is so resistant to change, in a moment when we're challenged sometimes, human nature can jump to the opposite extreme where we're ready to change everything. If one perspective gets challenged or if one idea gets challenged, then, then we can all of a sudden go from, no, I'm not changing and, and no, I'm not going to shift my perspective and no, nothing's going to change, to all of a sudden 
We're questioning everything. And we're willing to throw everything in the past out the window and believing that we're embracing this new change that is for our good. Uh, let me tell you something. Not everything needs to be thrown out just because our perspective is challenged. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, these Jewish people needed to understand this. The author of Hebrews is not, is not coming to them and writing this letter to them to say, look, forget about angels. What he's saying is, let's put angels in the proper perspective underneath the person of Jesus Christ. I, I, I kept reading into chapter 3 because I wanted you to see this. Growing up in that good Jewish home, back to your imagination again, Growing up in that good Jewish home, you would have been taught there's nobody like Moses. Moses was a central spiritual figure. He was respected. He was revered because he was the one that God chose on the backside of the desert to come down and lead God's people out of the bondage of Egypt to the promised land. And not only that, but God validated Moses' leadership and his direction again and again and again. And I'm telling you, God used Moses to write the first five books of the Bible, which gave the Jewish people their history, their direction, uh, uh, and, and still continues to do so even today, even though a lot of it has been changed and altered by liberal thought from modern rabbis and rabbinical literature and things like that, they still have a great value on the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, also called the Pentateuch. And, and growing up in a good Jewish home in the first century, you would have been taught Moses is a key central figure. He is to be revered. He is to be respected. And when the author of Hebrews goes to point out that Jesus is superior to Moses, he doesn't tear Moses down in order to do it. As a matter of fact, he validates just how great of a servant of God Moses really was. He says in verse number 2, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Verse 3, for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after, but Christ as a son over his own house whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Uh, wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. And he goes on to describe the works of Moses and how God used Moses. But he continually comes back to this idea, Moses was a faithful man. Just because we come in and say Jesus Christ is superior doesn't mean throw everything else away. It doesn't mean take everything that you've been taught and just completely dismiss it. Why? Because this isn't a matter of getting rid of one and replacing it with another. That's not what we're talking about here. He's not encouraging them to, to replace something here. The, the people that he's writing to are people that already are aware of Jesus Christ. They already know about Jesus Christ. Many of them, if not all of them, have already trusted in Jesus Christ. But he's saying to them, listen, don't just throw everything in your past away. Just make sure you got the proper perspective. Angels are still ministers of God that serve God and they minister to those that are the heirs of salvation. That's what he said. He goes on in chapter 3 to talk about Moses and he says, listen, yes, Jesus is greater than Moses, but he doesn't tear Moses down in order to, in order to show that. 
Jesus isn't replacing Moses. Moses, uh, when understood in his proper perspective, was just simply pointing to Jesus. He was a type of Jesus. And Moses' faithfulness and Moses' greatness was just a testimony of those things which would come after, which was a, a, a glimpse of the person of Jesus Christ. Now look, as an independent Baptist pastor, there's things I deal with on a regular basis. And I'll go even further. I'm not just an independent fundamental Baptist pastor, but I'm a conservative one. I'm a traditional one. That means that there's standards. Yeah, I still use that word. There's standards and things like that. And, and it means that I feel like people ought to be separate from the world. I believe that we as Christ followers ought to be distinct and we ought to be different from the world. I believe we ought to be different in appearance. I believe we ought to be different in attitude. I believe from the inside out, everything about us ought to be different and set apart than the world in which we live. Just because somebody has standards, just because uh, somebody believes in personal separation of the holy from the unholy doesn't mean that that person's a legalist. You say, preacher, you're sounding a little defensive. I'm not trying to be defensive. I'm trying to be factual. The truth is, legalism does exist among independent Baptist churches. I'd be lying if I didn't say it did. I think we, we are very careful and we try very hard to make sure that it has no place at South Campbell Avenue Baptist Church. But, but let's just be honest. Among churches that call themselves and identify as independent Baptist churches, there is a tendency in some, not all, but there's a ten, there can be a tendency in some toward legalism. Let me make sure you understand what legalism really is. Legalism is not having standards or being separated from the world. Legalism is when you begin to associate certain actions, certain do's and don'ts with righteousness. With the ability to please God. With the ability to have a better relationship with God. Let me tell you something. Anybody that has a relationship with God, they don't have that relationship with God because of their do's and don'ts. The only way we have a relationship with God is through the person of Jesus Christ. Because of his grace. That's it. That's the beginning and the end right there. There is not one of us by any do's and don'ts that could earn a relationship with God. It certainly won't earn us salvation and it will not earn us favor with God. We are not... We don't seek to be separated from the world in, <clears throat> in order to be righteous, but we ought to be separated from the world because we've been made righteous by the person of Jesus Christ. And there's a big difference because another part of human nature is that we uh, find it easier to quantify our do's and don'ts to give us some kind of idea and comparison point with others as to how we're doing in our walk with God and our spirituality. But I'm telling you, true spirituality is not based upon how well we perform or our do's or don'ts. I'm bringing this up because, yes, there is a tendency or can be a tendency to that among conservative independent Baptists, just like there was among Jews. As a matter of fact, if you want to do a study on legalism, just look at the, what the Jewish religion became. Not because that's the way God designed it, not, not because that's what the law was intended to do, but true legalism was being exercised by the, uh, by the, the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the Sanhedrin committee and the the Jewish leaders um, of the first century and, and uh, even um, decades leading up to that, and it was just very much a ritualistic society, and uh, the standards of righteousness were certainly made by men and not by God, and, 
people compared themselves with each other and, and people would go out on the street corner and make these great prayers and these big shows of their own personal righteousness and they felt entitled. They felt like they had special favor in relationship with God because of what they chose to do and didn't do. And I'm telling you, that is true legalism. True legalism. And you know what? When a Jew would come to know Jesus as Savior, every bit of that legalistic idea, every bit of that legalistic tendency needed to be thrown out the window. There is zero room for legalism in a true walk in relationship with God. Because it's not about our righteousnesses. It is completely about His grace. And church, we need to understand that. We, we definitely need to understand that, that we have a walk with God because of God's grace. And yes, we need to try to do what, what is right. And yes, we need to try to live above sin. And yes, we need to have victory in Jesus. But I'm going to tell you, victory in Jesus doesn't come by checking off a list of rules that we follow and therefore believing that everything's good between us and God. Because I'm telling you, you can follow every rule and you can check off every action and your attitude could be worse than the person that you think is the biggest sinner you know. And therein lies the problem. Who are we really trying to please? If we're trying to please God, then that can only be done by His grace through His Son. If we're trying to please ourselves, well, that's where legalism gets a real foothold. But let's just say that somebody like these Jewish people is coming into Christianity out of a legalistic background. Maybe it's not that you're coming into Christianity. Maybe you grew up in a form of Christianity, but it's been very uh, do and don't based and a lot of uh, association has been made with righteousness uh, comparatively with behavior and things like that. Can I tell you something? While there's no room for legalism in true Christianity and a true walk with God, that doesn't mean that everything that you grew up with has to be thrown out just to have the right perspective about the way you grew up. You know, people who have grown up in very strict homes and sometimes even legalistic homes I've had opportunity to talk with them, had opportunity to counsel with some. And what I found, I found out is there's typically two responses. One is the response that says, you know what? I don't necessarily agree with everything that happened in the way that I was brought up, but I have an appreciation for it. Because amidst the rules and things like that, while I was being taught that they would give me favor with God and they don't. They did also protect me. Those rules protected me. Those rules kept me safe. Those rules kept me away from harmful elements of the world. And so while I don't necessarily agree with what the perspective was from a legalistic perspective on those things growing up, I have appreciation for those things and still implement many of those things in my walk with the Lord and my Christian life from the right perspective. But the other mentality can be very damaging. And that is this. I've now found freedom in Christ. And freedom in Christ means I'm throwing everything away. Everything that I grew up with. Everything that I was taught. Everything that, that had significance in, in my legalistic upbringing. I have no use for any of it. I have only my new freedom in Christ. And I'm, I'm willing to throw all of this away. Can I tell you something? That could be very, very dangerous. It could be very harmful. A lot of times that comes from an attitude of bitterness. And the bitterness 
a lot of times comes from an attitude of uh, a heart of pain. And I have every bit of sympathy for the pain that's caused by imperfect people. But the reality is every one of us are imperfect. Every one of us have problems. Every one of us have issues. Every one of us have had and probably do have the wrong perspective on something that needs to be addressed by God's word and changed. But as I've studied the book of Hebrews to preach it, and I've tried to, uh, I've tried to really immerse myself in the passage and understand what was, be, what was being written and who it was being written to, I, immediately this struck me as I read the first few chapters uh, uh, in the book of Hebrews, and that is this, that by the inspiration of God, the author is very careful not to dismantle the truths that had been and would continue to be so precious to the life of these believers. But rather what he would seek to do is put everything in its proper place. Everything in its proper place perspective you know you've probably heard the testimony of some body who came to know Jesus as Savior they came out of a family who never uh, never darkened the door of a church dad was a drunkard mom was unfaithful and and uh, they grew up like mom and dad and pretty soon they were they were in the liquor and they were into drugs and uh, it's so true that what parents do in moderation, children do in excess. And so, uh, and, and so somebody just really, I mean, just immerse themselves fully in the, wor in the world. And by God's grace, they hear the gospel and the gospel affects them in their heart and convicts them of their sin and they realize their need for salvation and they call upon Jesus and ask him for salvation and God changes their life completely. You've heard those testimonies. And those testimonies go something like this. I, ha I repented of all of that. My whole life, my whole lifestyle was wrong and I repented of it and I turned my back to it and I began to follow Christ. And I'm telling you, that is absolutely necessary to turn your back from on every false way, to turn your back on every sin, on every wrongdoing, that, that is so necessary for a child of God to realize the wrong of sin and the world and to repent and turn from it and follow Jesus Christ. But there's also the testimony of those that have grown up under a mom and dad who knew Jesus as Savior. They weren't perfect, but they loved the Lord they loved their family, and they tried to raise their children in a way for them to know the Lord, for them to be kept from the harms and the evils of the world and society. And maybe they didn't have the right perspective on some things growing up. But can I just encourage you tonight, just like these Hebrews, just like these Jews that are being written to here, even though God's word challenges you and God says, hey, I need to put some things in the right perspective. I need to make sure that you've got the right ideas about some things. That doesn't mean God's telling you that you got to get rid of everything you were taught, of every practice in your Christian home growing up. Because some of it might be as good and as right and as true as the existence and power of angels. Some of it might, have, might be as good and right and true as the faithfulness and the leadership of Moses. And Maybe you came up in that upbringing and you came through some situations where some things were just emphasized very, very strongly and now in your Christian life and now in your Bible reading, you're realizing that maybe they were emphasized a little too strongly. Number one, consider this. Maybe you don't know all the details as to what went behind mom and dad's decisions 
to put that in the home as a safeguard. Maybe just realize this. Maybe as you're maturing, God's just trying to show you, no, those things are good and right. Just make sure that they're in their proper perspective. Jesus is always number one. Jesus has got to be first and foremost. And I love how over and over again, we're going to see this as we go through the book of Hebrews, over and over again, when something was wrong in the Jewish thinking, the author addresses it as wrong. But there were many things that were right in the Jewish understanding. They just didn't have the right place, the right significance, or the right authority. And there were some things that were good and right and true, but the Jewish people just put them over everything else or equal with Jesus. And the author of Hebrews comes along and says, Look, I'm not asking you to get rid of this idea. I'm not asking you to just throw this, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Or as I called it, throw the angels out with the bathwater. I'm just asking you, by the word of God, put everything in the proper perspective. I'll tell you, that's a life that tends toward peace. That's a life that tends toward joy. And it's the only way that we can have a consistent walk with God. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless your word tonight. I pray that you'd challenge us and stir our hearts. God, with every idea, with every notion, where no matter where we received it, Lord, God, help us to check it against your word to make sure that we're viewing each and every aspect of our lives in the proper perspective putting significance where it belongs, and Lord, having a willingness to repent and turn from anything that shouldn't be in our life at all. God, I pray that you'd help us. I pray that you'd bring us back again soon together to uh, meet together, to love on one another, and fellowship as, as you have commanded. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless, and we'll look forward to seeing you on Sunday, Lord willing.